cuts the senior UN official who's been involved, as I was saying, in many of the world's biggest humanitarian emergencies. Currently, the organization's deputy regional humanitarian coordinator for the Syria crisis. Mark, thanks so much for bearing with us. I'm so glad that we've been able to re-establish the line with you. Um, we were just seeing you about five minutes ago outside, and I could see some trucks behind you. Tell us about what sort of, I presume that there's aid inside those trucks. What sort of assistance are you sending to Syria? Who's getting it and where are they? Yes, well, we have a massive aid operation. Um, at the moment, it's about 1,000 trucks a month that cross the border from Turkey into northwest Syria. Uh, these trucks are all carrying food, uh, medical supplies. Um, they're carrying tents and blankets and water and sanitation equipment. Um, they're carrying emergency relief items for millions of people who are trapped in a war zone. Um, many of these people are living in camps in, uh, in horrible conditions. Uh, there are not enough um, schools, there are not enough hospitals and clinics for all of these people. Um, we've really been trying to scale up this aid operation because uh, this is, you know, the world's biggest humanitarian crisis. Um, and within Syria, this is probably the area that has the highest humanitarian needs. So um, every month, um, we, we just have, you know, huge numbers of trucks that cross this border. Who is responsible for the delivery of aid once it arrives in Syrian territory, because that seems to be one of the political issues. How much freedom does the UN have to give the assistance to the people it thinks need it most? Well, the people on the ground who, who are receiving the aid and distributing it are Syrian organizations, Syrian humanitarian organizations. Um, some of them are international um, organizations, but they're all staffed by Syrians. Now, the United Nations has a um, a very elaborate monitoring mechanism. We actually inspect every single truck of um, humanitarian supplies that go across the border. We then do monitoring at the warehouses on arrival. We then do monitoring at the distribution point, and we also do post-distribution monitoring. So the, the role that the United Nations has played in this relief operation is that um, we inform the Syrian government about every truck of aid that goes in, it's a very accountable, very transparent operation, and we make absolutely every effort to prevent any aid diversion, to prevent any interference in our humanitarian activities, and we've never detected any large-scale aid diversion because we do have very robust mechanisms in place to make sure that we know exactly where the aid is going. And the world will hope that the Russians, when the UN Security Council comes to vote on keeping this uh, border crossing open, understand what you've just explained. I won't ask you a political question about that, Mark. I understand where your responsibilities lie. Tell us about the people of Idlib. Are they trapped in that part of northwestern Syria? Is there nowhere else for them to get any help apart from international assistance? Well, yes, they, they are trapped in that area. Most of these people fled from the government-controlled areas, and they do not want to go back into the areas they fled from. And they're not coming into Turkey because Turkey already hosts more Syrian refugees than all the other countries in the world put together. I mean, Turkey hosts many more refugees than any other country in the world. So, um, you know, refugees are not coming into Turkey that these people are not going back into the government-controlled areas. So the only way to help them, really, is if we can get aid across the border into that area. And um, that's why it's so essential that the Security Council authorize the UN to continue this massive aid operation. Mark, thank you so much indeed. Mark Kutz speaking to us from Rehanli on the Turkish side of the border with Syria.